today uh, we're going to start a new series of messages. It's going to run us through Easter, uh, and we're just going to entitle this message, this series of message, uh, in his own words. You, you remember over the last couple of months, I was telling you, uh, we're going to get to this point where we just use the red letter versions, uh, red letter words from Scripture. Uh, and we're going to listen to what Jesus has to say about certain topics and things that we have going on in our life, questions we may have. And I thought the best way to do that today was just start out with let him answer the question, who is Jesus? Don't let me tell you who he is, but let him in his own words tell you who Jesus is. And I've had so many conversations over this past year, uh, especially with all that's gone on between COVID and uh, unrest in the world we live in. Uh, people ask the question, preacher, uh, what in the world is going on? Uh, do you think that we're in the end times or, or when do you think the end will come and, and, and what can we do? Now, friend, I wish I had the answer. I wish I could tell you today I knew exactly when God was going to say, all right, I'm getting ready to come back. I'm going to be coming down your street. I'm going to show up on your neighborhood. I'm going to pull up to your house on this date and this time. But God doesn't give any of us that special revelation no matter who may say they have it, because Jesus would say in his own words, uh, no one knows the time nor the hour except the Father. And so we're waiting on that great and glorious time. The only thing I do know is that we are in those end days, and, and, and I know that we should all be ready. And the only thing that we can do to be ready for when that time comes is to accept Jesus as our personal Savior. Many of you in this room have already made that commitment, and I'm thankful for that. Maybe today, if you haven't made that choice, that decision to follow Christ, by the end of the day, you're going to understand why you need to know Jesus. There, there lays a problem for many. In the world of inclusiveness, where one way is as good as the next, as we talked about last week, it's hard to get people to see the dire need that they, they find themselves in. Uh, that they do need a relationship with Christ. They don't know how lost they really are without Jesus. And, and as we watch those who are in authority around us, such as uh, having a U.S. congressman make the statement uh, last week in, in a session of Congress where he says, what any religious tradition describes as God's will is of no concern to this Congress. Well, he was really saying, you know, right now let's just debate the issue. Let's don't bring your religious beliefs into uh, what what your opinions are on the matter but we also see the degradation of our society when we lean that way and no respect for god in, in those settings many find themselves thinking and hoping that they are in god's will only to be uncertain and and even opposed to it when it goes against their personal preferences their agenda their feelings their opinions and many even find themselves saying things like well, what did Jesus really say about this? Or did Jesus really tell us that about so-and-so? And maybe today you find yourself in that situation. And the great thing about those questions is that we can go to the Bible. We can go to see exactly what Jesus has to say about many of the issues and topics that we face in our personal lives and, and what we face on a daily basis in the world around us. And so this week, as I mentioned, we're going to start this series of messages titled, In His Own Words. Not what Dan says, not what the next TV preacher, not what the next uh, popular uh, speaker may say, but what does Jesus say as he draws us to the Scriptures? And for those who may not be aware of it, we're going to be looking at the red-letter versions of Scripture. The, that, that's where the... The, the publishers knew that the words of Christ were, were so important that many of them published a version of Scripture where Jesus' words were highlighted in red so that when you open it, you automatically know who's speaking. You don't have to worry about who is the author, who is the one speaking about, who is the one communicating here. And so I've told people on countless occasions in my time in ministry when, when I was getting close to Jesus myself, and I would ask people, you know, what can I read? What book of Scripture could I read that would help me know more about what God's will is for my life? And they would reference a particular book. Nothing wrong with that. Well, if it's the book of John, or, or maybe you need to go to Colossians. or Those are wonderful texts of Scripture. 
But what I learned in my own personal walk is when I got alone and I just read the words of Jesus, what it had to say, it helped me learn so much about my own personal walk and what Jesus' heart was for me and the world around me and the things that I face. And so I pray as we look into this series over the next few weeks, you're going to feel that as well. So today, before we start trying to see what Jesus thought on all the matters that seem to worry us in our own world and, and what touches to the heart of uh, my personal opinion, my agenda, or my feeling on something, maybe we just need to get back and answer the question and let him do it in his own words, who is Jesus? Well, he tells us first off as we look into the scriptures he'll tell us he's the narrow gate in, in early in bible times we we saw where shepherds were 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 out taking care of their flocks many of them were shepherds they tended they took care of animals and and so they would find a place maybe on the hillside or cliffs and they would set up some type of fence structure and they would have just a small opening where the sheep could go in and go out and that way they could defend that particular area and watch over their flock well in the evenings when it was time to corral and watch over their herds uh, it provided that place of safety for their herds to lie down and they could keep watch over it against those who would come in predators thieves and can care for their flocks well jesus says this he makes reference to himself being this gate in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. He says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few will find it. Now, remember, we spoke a couple of weeks ago how Jesus said he came to give us life. As a matter of fact, he tells us in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. Remember those shepherds as they're watching over their flock. The reason that they are there is to protect against those who would come in and kill and steal and destroy. And Jesus not only now says that he is that shepherd, but he then says that he is also this gate. If you really want to be safe, you're going to have to come through me. And there's a reason the Bible uses this imagery of us being sheep, because we are so similar to them in so many different ways. We, we get led in so many different d directions. It is a shame to watch the way that we respond on a personal basis. I, I think there's not a person in this room at some point in time maybe have bought into some type of pyramid scheme or some type of scam. Uh, you go on social media and it says uh, Coca-Cola, uh, I saw one today, Coca-Cola is giving away uh, this bag with all their goodies in it and, and, and Walmart wants to give you $750 and all you have to do is share this and comment and send us some information and I don't think so. I'm not that naive. But let's so well, let's don't get too far ahead of ourselves. Maybe we are that naive at times. Maybe we want to think that things are going to be that good. Uh, you've seen where they said, share this picture of this money. And by the end of the week, you're going to receive a financial blessing. So we said, well, what can it hurt? It's about like buying a lottery ticket, isn't it? Maybe I will win. Maybe it will be some truth in it. Only to find out, once again, we've been let down, and it was for somebody else's gain. Jesus says, don't be led like sheep. Don't be led astray. And, and we put ourselves in harm's way when we live that way. God tells us to come through this narrow gate. There's not going to be any other way. We, we say, but what if there really is another way? There's a reason why they had shepherds, and there's a reason why shepherds today have sheep dogs, because they know that they need a herding animal, because there are always some that will follow, and there are going to be some who will go astray. Jesus uses the imagery of the 99 and the one who goes, doesn't he? He says what happens when 
there's 99 and one goes astray. He said, that he goes and looks for me, brings them back. And he's so happy and is rejoicing when, when the one that was lost comes back and they, they, they restore them. We find ourselves at times wanting to see what's out there and we go astray. God tells us to come through the narrow gate. And we see family and friends sometimes who don't live the way that we live. They don't believe the way that we believe. They don't follow Jesus. They've never accepted Christ as their own personal Savior. And, 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 and then we say, well, they're good people. Uh, they're wonderful folks. I, I even ask for advice. They've never steered me wrong in life. And yet they don't follow Jesus. So maybe if they're not going the same direction I am, they can't all be bad. Yes, Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate, and I'm the gate. And no one who enters through this gate can be deadly. No, all who enter through that have eternal life. You remember last week we talked about what? Choices and consequences. And today Jesus says you want to choose what gate you will go through. And though it may look broad in the area which you would go out in the world, that leads to destruction. Not only does he tell us he's a narrow gate, he also says he's the one who opens and shuts the door. In 2011, I was blessed to go to Louisville, Kentucky, uh, and attend a minister's retreat with, with Bob Russell. Now, many of you know who Bob Russell is, but those of you who don't, Bob was uh, the minister for Southeast Christian Church uh, for 40 years. He retired back a few years prior to this, and and he, he, he began to minister to ministers. Uh, we went there just a couple of years ago. We went to Louisville, and one of the places we wanted to take Trey was to Louisville at, at, to Southeast Christian Church. Just let them see what God can do when people just turn themselves over to him. That previous Sunday, it was in July, and that previous Sunday it had over 30,000 people attend worship services at their Blankenbaker campus. Now, they quit building larger campuses. They now plant churches in the areas and where people live, and they have six or seven other campuses now. But Bob has always had a heart for ministry and loving people and drawing them close to the Lord. And, and so it was one of the most spiritual enriching times of my life, not only for my ministry, but personally as well. And over the course of the week, Bob and Ben Merrill and Bob's team uh, supported uh, us they loved us they prayed for us they prayed with us they they always found a way to serve us in some capacity we we thought we were vips he takes you in small groups and you would have just thought you were the only person in the world when people were dealing with you and each day there was always after a time of devotion and 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 teaching there was always something special we did and as our week began to draw close to the end we found ourselves in Bob's home there with his wife, Miss Judy, and they invited us for dinner and just a time of fellowship. And it was during this evening that I met a man that I'll never forget. His name was Nabil Qureshi. And Bob had invited Nabil to come to his house and share the story of his journey of finding Jesus. Nabil grew up in a Pakistani family who had uh, migrated and, immig and were immigrants to America. And he was taught the rich traditions of Islam and, and the Muslim faith. And he, he was taught early on to memorize the Quran and, and the prayers that they would offer up throughout the different days as a young man. And he was even taught to memorize, though you may think it sounds odd, parts of the Christian Bible. And as he was there, he was sharing his story of how he found Jesus. To hear under Bill tell his story, he loved when Christians, especially those young people in high school, they, they, they go to their youth groups, he said. They would come to church on Sunday and uh, uh, Monday, uh, a Sunday, and then they go to school on Monday, and they've been told by their youth pastor they probably need to go find somebody and win them to Jesus, and they thought they were doing the right thing. And, and so he would use those passages of Scripture that he had learned from the Christian Bible to challenge people to understand what they believed. And make them even doubt their own faith. And to hear him tell it, the more he did this, the bolder he grew in his own personal faith. And so he did this unwavering, and, and he became a strong Muslim believer. And As a matter of fact, 
the more he answered the challenges of surface-level Christians, the, the bolder he became. But then he went to college, and he studied to be a doctor and actually became a doctor. And it was there, though, in his time of studies that God had, had him room with a young Christian man that was also studying to be a doctor. And he asked him about his faith, and as a result, Nabil said, oh, here's another one. And so he began to have dialogue with him about the, each other's faith. And he cl they grew to be close friends. And finally, Nabil began to seriously consider the reality of Jesus. He had questioned his own faith at times in the talks that they had had together. And Nabil then began to know the consequences of beginning to believe in Jesus. It could mean being banned and cut off from his family. As a matter of fact, he would later, after accepting Christ, uh, face death threats because of his choice to follow Jesus. So he decides, he decides during this time while he's in college, he says, okay, God, if Jesus is really the Messiah, then you need to let me know. You're going to have to reveal the truth to me. He was specifically looking for a dream or a vision because he says in Islam, dreams and visions are very powerful and they have so much connection to their spiritual walk. And then one night, he had a dream about this great party or banquet that was going on. And he said he saw a lot of people he had known over the years going in through this door. And as they were there, they walked in. He said, I had to look down. It was a, kind of a small door. He said, but there was a lot of people in there. And he says, and there was my good friend, my roommate, who I spent so much time talking and, and, and sharing our faith together. And we would, we'd share some of our most personal, intimate details of our life there he is sitting and i knew nothing about this party and i was angry because he didn't invite me and i so nabil says hey man let me in let me he says i i can't let you in he says i have no control over who's here and then he pointed at someone and he said there was jesus and it was him who came and shut the door and when he says, let me in, he says, I can't because I don't know you. I, re I offered an invitation and you did not respond. And the bill said it was then that this passage of scripture came to him from Luke chapter 13. Remember, I told you, the bill was taught the scriptures, especially the New Testament about Jesus. They have no problem, believe it or not, with the Old Testament. But the New Testament about Jesus, there's an issue. And he says, this passage of scripture came to him from Luke chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading. Sir, open the door to us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say to him, we ate with you and drank with you, and, and you taught us in the streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, you, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. And when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out, people will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and the first who will be last. Then the bill said that, that when he woke up, he was there crying and weeping. He said he had been sweating profusely. And, and he said, he says, I believe, Jesus, that you're the Messiah. They said, you're the one who, who I need. And you're the one who opens and shuts the door. Lord, I want to come in. Please let me in. And if you want to know more about Nabil, you can go on YouTube and type Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. And in his own words, he'll tell you his story. But what a powerful impact. Man, we need to know more about Jesus. We need to know who he is in our own personal lives so profoundly that nothing will shake us in our faith. Jesus says, I am the one who opens and closes the door. 
I mean, if you want to go to heaven, if you're looking for glory, you need to be knowing Jesus because he's the one who will let you in. He'll be also the one who has to shut you out. Finally, Jesus tells us this. In his own words, when we ask the question, who is Jesus? He's the only way home. Many of you know since coming to New Testament Christian Church, uh, I became a papa. Uh, Miss Diane this morning said, I saw some pictures of Stella. She's getting to be so big. And this morning, it just so happened, uh, I was thinking about this particular video that Amy had done of Stella when she was two years old, walking around in, in our yard on a trailer I have, and she, she's singing, Jesus loves me. You know, you can't hardly understand her uh, and all that she's saying, she's got the Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. She could say that, but it was all the other stuff that went along with it that she was like, blah, 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 and she sounds like her papa at times when he's talking, just muddling through things. And I, and I was thinking about that this week and when I was writing this message. And I said, man, if I could just pull up that video and play it. And then this morning, of all mornings, it says, here's a memory from four years ago. And if you want to see that, you go on my Facebook and, and you just look at that little memory I shared today. And, and when she gets through singing, she's so excited because we used to sing that when she was a baby when we would commute back and forth to meet her mom during the day because Mama has watched her since she was a baby. And so when we would commute back and forth, meeting Mom in the morning and meeting, meeting her in the afternoon to, to, to give her back to Mom, we, we would sing. And we would sing, Jesus loves me, over and over and over again. It just seemed to soothe her. Even when Papa sang, it soothes her. Yeah, you know. You know. But when she gets to the end of her song, and she says, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. At two years old in her own little language. And she's clapping, and she's clapping, and she's clapping. And she looks at me, she says, clap, Papa, clap. And there's something to be excited about because Jesus loves me. This I know. He's the one who's going to get me home. And as I think about Stella and her growth now, she's got a birthday coming up at the end of this month. She'll be six years old. And, and she's at the age where she's learning new things, and she doesn't want to be a little baby anymore, and she wants to be a big girl. And we've had to buy a different car seat or booster seat different, so she could use the, the, uh, the regular adult seat belt she's not a little kid anymore she had this little booster chair she was set in at our dining room table she always loved to sit in it until last week she always she, she didn't want to get rid of it her mom said she doesn't need that chair she can sit in a regular chair and she's not want to sit in it and and then last week she says no i'm not going to sit in that chair amy was getting her lunch ready and she said i'll get you get in your chair and i'll get your lunch and and she was like no i don't sit in that little chair she, she sat in Papa's chair. But then she was so low, she had to go get a pillow off the couch and sit on that. So, but she was just bound to determine she didn't want a booster. And so now she's watching everywhere we go. And many of you know she lived with us, her and her mom did, for a couple of years. And so her earliest memories that she's recalling are living with us and that being home. Now, for a while, when we would travel and we'd go somewhere, she says, she says, I, I, we're, we're almost home. You know why she knew we were home? Because we were on the street in front of the house. That's when she would recognize where home was. But then it got where she would be a couple of blocks over. She says, I know we're almost at our house because there's... And then it got where we were further away. And now when we turn off the interstate to get to Ro uh, Roanoke Rapids, she says, oh, we're almost home because now we're off the highway and we're getting ready to turn left and... And she knows where she is. And it, may, it thrills my heart because I know she knows the way home. And Jesus says, it thrills my heart if you know the way home. Let me ask you, do you know your way home? Or are you looking to get to the Father's house? Jesus says in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you 
to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Now, Thomas asked him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Goes back to this imagery and idea of this narrow gate, doesn't it? It goes back to the thought of understanding who's opening and shutting the door. And so in answering the question, who is Jesus? He says, don't stay lost. I'm the way home. I, I, I have a place for you if you want it, but you have to want it. You, want, you need to come. And he says, look, I've got a place prepared specifically for you. You know, in today's marketing society, we love to think that we're the only person that they built this car for or they've opened this restaurant for. It's all for you. Everything's solely for you. If it weren't for you guys or you, if we, this would not be possible. So we're doing this all for you. And we know they didn't do it all for me. They, they're just tickling my ear enough to get me to buy into whatever they're selling. They really did it for them. But what Jesus is saying here, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there's a room specifically for you and nobody else. It's got your name on it. All you have to do is say, I want it and I'm coming. I know the way home. That's what Jesus wants for all of us. He wants to come into our life and he wants us to give him our life. You know, Galatians chapter 3 verse 27 It says, for all who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now, it's that time of the year when the weather's getting beautiful. The kids are getting out, and I saw the sign-up sheets online uh, this week for recreational sports. They're going to be signing up for their softball and their soccer and their baseball teams and they're going to be doing all these different recreational sports because it's just the time of the year for that. And and you're going to have kids and grandkids signing up for these programs. And they're going to be great, and you're going to enjoy that because you're going to watch them. And the great thing about it is they're not all going to be dressed alike. You're going to know who they are by the jersey, the color of their uniform. You're going to know them by their number. And Jesus says, if you want to be known as mine, I can mark you. The same way. You want to be a follower of mine? That's great. All you have to do is be baptized into Christ. I'll give you my Holy Spirit. You can clothe yourself. And when people see you, they're going to know who you belong to. You know why that is? There's nothing on the outside changed. If you were to go in today and you would go into this baptistry and be baptized into Christ, you come up, look, all you're going to do is look wet. But something on the inside is going to change. And you're going to be living different. The Bible says that we receive the Holy Spirit. He washes away all the things in our life that have not been pleasing to him. Those things that kept us shut out where we were going down the wrong way. We were going to Broadway in life where we got to the door and we realized this is not where I need to be. He says, this is how you're going to know. This is how you'll be different because the old man will be put aside. And the new creation will come. And so when we come out, there's so much change on the inside. Because the Holy Spirit now lives there. When we take bad stuff out, God gives us all the good to go back. That's what Jesus wants to do in our life. And so I hope today when you ask the question, well, who is Jesus? You can say that he is the gate that keeps me safe because he's my shepherd. I believe he is the one who, who, who can open and shut the door for eternity for me. And finally, I believe he's the only way home. And I want to follow him into eternity. And so let me ask you today. Will you clothe yourself in Christ? Jesus in his own word says there's no other choice. There's no other way. In just a moment, our worship team is going to come back and Lead us in our closing song.
I'm going to be praying right now. I don't know what God's doing in your life. I don't know where you stand with him. I don't even know what you believe about Jesus. Maybe you've just been saying, I think he's the right way. But in his own words, he's point blank telling us it's only him. There is no other way. So in our time of decision, and as we follow Christ, and as we make our minds up that we want to live for him and, and to walk with him, I pray today in this time of invitation that you're going to do just that. If you need to step forward and come forward and, and profess your faith in Christ, you're going to do that. If you need to be baptized into Christ, we're ready. We can do that. Maybe today you say, hey, look, I just need to rededicate myself. I need to recommit myself to who he is. I've gotten off track. I begin to buy into the lies of Satan, the one who came to kill, steal, and destroy. He's, he's offered me a whole lot that looks good out there, but in the end, that's what he's going to do to me. And so as we pray, let the Holy Spirit minister. Father, thank you. Oh, well, thank you, God, that today we're here. You blessed us with so much. And as we're here in this assembly of people, we're, we're in a comfortable place. You gave us a beautiful day and bright sun. You, you, you want to bring us out. And God, the words of Jesus are reminding us that there is something greater. I don't want to stay here. This is not the world I want to live in forever. Uh, too many people want to make this the best place ever. God, I want to get home. And I know the only way there is going to be through Jesus. He's reminding me through his own words that I can walk through eternity with him, but I've got to choose him. And there's going to come a day, God, when we have to answer the question, heaven or hell, which way will I go? Well, I need to know I know Jesus. And I pray for the people in this room that they know just that. Father, as we're committing ourselves in this time, maybe there's those who are, who are home online, they're watching, and they've got to make a decision. They're, they're having to choose right now. Will I follow Christ? And if they will, Lord, we praise God that they're making this choice. But, Father, if there's something in their life that's keeping them, as it is for those of us in this room, from making that public profession of following Christ, God, will you reveal it to us personally that we will not rest until it's out of our life. God, let us not buy into the world and the lies that are thrown at us that all roads are leading to the same place. If that's the case, let us lock our doors today, never to return, because what's the point? So, Father, let us be fully committed to Jesus. Help us to walk and know you. And as our worship team sings, and as they lead us, that we know you fully. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.